Hello and welcome to 18 WJTS Inform. I'm Bill Potter, your host. Joining us in the studio is State Senator Mark Mesmer. As the legislation ended last week, he comes in every Friday and kind of gives a recap of what's been happening. And over the past uh, last week and this mm -hmm. week, we're going to talk about some bills uh, that have been passed and what has happened with those. Senator, welcome to the show. Great to be here again. Too much to cover in one week. I know there is a lot. So we covered some last week. Mm -hmm. uh, and this week, we're going to talk about uh, different issues. And, and let's start off with, with ISTEP was... Okay probably one of the first things that people talked about in the legislation. Yeah, the first thing we dealt with when session started was last year's transition year of ICE, you know, from, from the old standards to the new standards mm -hmm. and all of the implementation problems, the length of the test problems, just a lot of, a lot of things didn't go smoothly last year. And so this year we, we paused the impact of, I mean, we didn't let those, any change in the test scores impact school grades or teacher evaluations. Okay. So that was the first week or two. I mean, that was, you know, House bill, Senate bills done and, and off to the governor and he's already signed that into law. So we took the, that hiccup year out, out of play. The federal government, in their wisdom, you know, they mandate new common core standards they don't mandate it, but they tell you if you want any money, you got to do. I mean, one of those. So basically, they mandate, they mandate it. it. You want the money, you got to do this. Now we didn't call it Common Core, but we're 95 percent. I mean, we, you know, we've, we're still. You have to follow their standards. Mm -hmm. Textbooks only come written that way. ACT and SAT tests, you know, starting this year. I mean, and and moving forward, if you're not complying with the with the those standards, you're you're going to end up shortchanging our students down the road. So. They tell you you have to change your standards. They tell you you have to change your test to meet the new standards. And then every state that's done it has seen, you know, the 15 to 20 point drop that we saw this year in, in results. They tell you, well, you can't reset your, if, if, a, if a passing score one year was, you know, 70 and, and, and we saw a 10 or 15 or whatever point drop and the new average was 55, they wouldn't let you just reset your, you know, your average passing grade. They said, oh, we, we can't do that. It's which would have been an easier easy, way. To, easy yeah. thing to do, just reset your scale and, and start For one fresh. year and then move forward. Okay. But no. So since they wouldn't let us do that, they would, they did, they said, but you can do with the results whatever you want. So, well, you know, we have our new baseline. And so we just said, well, okay, we won't, you know, we'll just pause you know, doing anything with them. Mm -hmm. They let you do that, which in effect gives you a new, uh, with a one-year pause, you, ha you now have a new baseline. So will you have to address <laughs> I-STEP again next year? Well, we're stuck with I-STEP is in going on, you know, now. Mm -hmm. And, and we, uh, last year, the Department of Education wrote a new two-year contract with, you know, they, they had McGraw-Hill, who they fired last year for all of their multiple-year problems. And they've got a new company called Pearson okay. that they hired to do this year's test, and they're committed. They had, you know, they had to do a minimum two-year contract. So we'll have one more year of I-STEP, but uh, House Bill 1395 was the repeal, and throw it out. We're done with I-STEP. Okay. After after this current cycle is done, and there's a task force been put together that'll consist of some, you know, the legislative education folks. The, some state department, uh, state department of education folks, the state school board folks, educators from, you know, the K through 12 field. Uh, there'll be, be a task force that's going to basically decide either redesign the test or go to something like Iowa Basics, like okay. we used to use forever. Does exactly what we need to do. Uh, there's a, a Northwest Northwest Education Alliance that can do you know something like an Iowa Basics test or you know. Do some type of national standardized test that doesn't cause us to reinvent the wheel as you know as a standalone state. If we use the IO Basics type test, it'd be you know incredibly less expensive. We can give local schools the option of which one to use, and give them some you know some flexibility and choice in the matter. I think as long as you know, you know year to year, you know you can check the benchmarks on students and how they're doing with with any of those tests and. And it's going to show, you know, if they're maintaining at grade level or, you know, raising or dropping. 
all provide the same data we need and, and a much easier, much simpler, and much less expensive way to do it and a shorter time frame. So it hasn't been decided yet which way to go. The replacement has been decided. They'll, they will you know, meet during the study committee time. They'll come back with a recommendation in the next year. We'll vote on we'll, it. We'll, we'll approve it. Okay. So. And for people, why do we need to do this testing? What's, wh how, what is the data used for? Uh, basically, just to make sure you know, kids are Kids are learning and improving, mm -hmm. um, and you know, make sure they're. It's more or less to tell you when a kid is is losing losing ground and and, and you know, get in to analyze why. Uh, I mean, I think everybody agrees that performance testing is a good thing to do. Measuring students' progress is a good thing to do, mm -hmm. but the details of how you do it and with the repeal of No Child Left Behind in December by the federal government, that and, and their their connection of your federal dollars to the specific type of test we were, you know, stuck with. Mm -hmm. I mean, what we were doing in ISTEP, that was, you know, to get your federal dollars for Title I and free and reduced lunch and all the, you know, uh, special ed money, all, to get your, your money, you had to test the way they were telling us we had to test. Well, they, they canceled that in December. Okay. So we have the opportunity now to, you know, and they told you how, you know, what type of prescriptive method you had to use. So. All of that led to, you know, really, you know, the problems we were having and most other states were having with, with the type of standardized test we were using. It'll give us a chance to go back to, you know, to a simpler, more, you know, more efficient, less expensive uh, test like the Iowa Basics test that gives you really all the data you need to make sure that, you know, the, if, if a kid's in third grade and he's testing at, at a 3.6 or a 2.5 and the next year, you know, it, you know, as they as they move up, are they keeping at grade level? Or are they losing ground? And it does give you some measure of how your schools are doing. You know, I mean, it does it does help give you data to help make sure that schools are performing and, and, and doing their job adequately. Uh, there, you know, no disagreement on do we need to, you know, do we need to review teacher performance every year? Do we need to, need to review student performance, the school performance? But the devil's in the details, and we need to make sure it's not so burdensome and so time-consuming that it, it takes away from you know the time that you need just to teach your kids the actually you know teach them the skills and, and not get over the top on you know testing time and and you know giving kids tests that become so critical that they you know they're stressed out so. Okay, and, and an unrelated bill, mm -hmm. but yet related in that's education, teacher recruitment, mm -hmm. a, a bill has been passed to improve that. Several bills that we dealt with. Uh, uh, one was uh, House Bill 1002. It's, it's, an, it's a scholarship program that the Department of Education will award 200 scholarships per year for uh, people entering the education field. It'll be, I think, a $6,000 a year scholarship. Mm -hmm. So they'll be able to accumulate, I think, up to thirty thousand dollars for you know for college expenses, and uh, and, and a great tool to help uh, incentivize folks to enter the teaching profession. And one of the other bills we dealt with this year, you know, when t when you do have teachers that are you know teaching, and in ad addition to that, you know, doing debate team, doing doing mentoring, doing AP classes, doing dual credit classes, all all the things that are on top of their normal duties, there are certain provisions of that that they could, you know, schools could give additional stipends for somehow along the way. We had not, I mean, we did dual credit stipends uh, in, in one of the prior years, but somehow we left uh, AP class teaching out of the, you know, out of the mix. So we got AP and, and people who are teacher mentors, you know, that, that are helping the, old, the more experienced teachers that are helping mentor the younger teachers, giving them, you know, allowing the schools, and it's a May provision allowing a, a superintendent or school boards to approve additional stipends for things that teachers are doing that are above and beyond the call. Uh, it, it's hard for them to want to give up the extra time if there's no, you know, no incentive to do that. So those were all things to help support, you know, get, you know giving teachers opportunity to get into education and then rewarding for the extra time they put in. Indiana, unfortunately, is one of the leaders, or the leader, in meth lab mm -hmm. uh, production. In the top three, for sure. Okay, and, and, and not the top. so a bill has been passed to try and curb that. And mm -hmm. I know that was kind of controversial because some people are saying, well, 
I'm a good guy, mm -hmm. don't penalize me, but then you somehow need to control, I guess, how, how yeah. th these ingredients needed to make meth are, are being distributed, yeah. and that's what happened with that. Yeah, very, a very good bill, and, and really several years in, in, the, in the process of getting to this point. Uh, Senate Bill 80, um, and it was actually Senate Bill 80 that, that, that um, Randy had you know, filed on our side of the, the, the building. When it went to the House, there was a, a bill authored by uh, Representative Smaltz that he amended his language in the Senate Bill 80. And then when we got to, to that conference committee time, and, and, and the House approved that version of it overwhelmingly. And then when it got back to the Senate, some of the pill manufacturers, you know, got all, uh, they, they started working the halls pretty hard. And they had kept throwing up red flags. Well, this part of the bill isn't going to work, and that part of the bill isn't going to work. And they were trying to work through some conference committee language on, a, on a, you know, some revisions to get the, you know, get the bill in, in the shape that they wanted. And it finally, on the last day, um, when they, they kept, we kept wearing out their arguments and we kept, you know, shooting down one after the other. So they finally, they, they didn't like the conference committee version to the point where the pill manufacturers said, okay, we like the version of the representative Smaltz passed in the House, you know, better. We'll just, we'll just back off and, and if you guys will adopt that one, we're okay. So that bill ended up then brought back as what they call, instead of a conference committee, we ended up concurring to the changes that, that Representative Smaltz made to the bill when the House worked on it, and that's the bill we ended up proving last night by, it might have been, I don't know if it was unanimous, there might have been three votes against in the Senate. But uh, it allows... Uh, I was going to say, what, so basically, yeah. for the consumer, what does mm -hmm. this mean? A pharmacist, if, if, if you have a relationship with a pharmacist, if you're, you're a, you're a, you have any other prescriptions at that pharmacy, the pharmacist knows who you are. You don't need a prescription. You buy your, your pseudoephedrine products just like you have all along. But will you have to go to the pharmacist to get it? You, ha it you, ha you have okay. to go to a pharmacist to get it. You won't be okay. able to get it at the, at the convenience store. Okay. It has to be dispensed you know, by a, you know, at a pharmacy. Okay. Now, the pharmacy tech, you know, if they look up and they say, oh, oh, Bill Potter, well, sure, you're a customer here. Hmm. The pharmacy tech can say, yep, you're, you're in the system, you're a legitimate customer, and then they can sell you the product, no prescription needed. Uh, one of the, I'll call it a trailer bill, Senate Bill 161 that we had, if you have a drug conviction, a felony, in the last seven years, along with, they, they currently did the scanning system, like where they scanned your driver's license, mm -hmm. tracked how much you bought. Uh, as part of the tracking mechanism, your, if you have a drug conviction, your drug conviction will go into that same database. So if you have a drug conviction, you'll have to have a prescription. You can still get it, but you'll have to get a prescription to get okay. it. Sure. Um, and then another one of the concerns is, oh, we're going to overload the, uh, the system that tracks all prescriptions. Because if you have a prescription for it, then any any of those prescriptions get, there's another database that law enforcement tracks pseudoephedrine purchases, and then they also track prescription purchases to make sure people aren't buying, you know, painkillers, you know, more than, you know, more than a person should be. So the, the prescription purchases will go into that pool. So if a person who's buying it for methamphetamine ends up getting multiple prescriptions, mm -hmm. The prescri prescription data will be tracked. The non-prescription data will be tracked. And you say this guy's buying too much. This guy's buying too yeah. much. Okay. So, so okay. Uh, but the, the normal person that goes to Walmart, Walgreens, CVS, any pharmacy you pick, uh, if you're if you're currently a customer at that pharmacy, you'll have no trouble. And if you're traveling, and and you say, oh, I've got you know, you, for some reason, if you forget your take stuff with you, if, and if you're someplace where you don't have a relationship with that pharmacist, the pharmacist can, can talk to you as a customer, and, and if he determines, yes, you need the product, he can give it to you without a prescription. Okay. That allows that pharmacist to, at that point, make a, a de determination, yeah, this guy's got 
hay fever, allergies, he needs it. Right. Even if you're not a normal customer, they can sell it to you. And if they suspect you to be a meth purchaser, they can block the sale. Okay. Uh, there was a, a bill passed making tougher penalties. Mm -hmm. You would think uh, a drug dealer uh, currently to be, to be convicted of a drug felony, a drug dealer felony, you had to be caught in the transaction with an undercover law enforcement officer buying and selling drugs. Um, just having 100 pounds of marijuana in your trunk didn't classify you as a drug dealer unless you got caught transferring it, selling, transferring it. It, selling okay. it. So anything above 28 grams, which is about an ounce of methamphetamine, cocaine, heroin, anything above that in your possession, you will now be able to be convicted a, 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 as a drug dealer. Anything above 10 pounds of marijuana, you're automatically able to be con, you know, charged as a drug dealer just from having over 10 pounds of marijuana, which is a, sure. a lot, yeah. or you know, anything over 28 grams or one ounce of any you know, hard narcotic type uh, drug, you could be charged and, and you know, probably not very difficultly uh, convicted as a, as a drug dealer. And then along with that, if you have a, uh, your second drug dealing conviction, you have now a mandatory 10-year minimum sentence, no reduction of time on a second conviction. You know, if, if it were normally would have been you know, a four to 10-year sentence, you have to serve the maximum with no reduction in time on a second conviction of a, of a drug trafficking conviction. So trying to make sure we give our tighter. prosecutors and, and it, it, now people who, who use marijuana or who get caught with, you know, if, if you're, you're, there's still going to be some penalties, but with the addiction problems and things that we addressed last session with giving tools to people who are incarcerated for, you know, just, you know, drug possession, we, we're working to aim towards treatment and, and of that addiction. Um, if there's a mental health issue that goes with that, we started working on that last year. But if you're a, if you're a dealer, we wanted to make sure we we make a clear message that if you're if you're a dealer, you're gonna you're gonna pay the penalty. Now we're almost out of time, but, mm -hmm. but quickly, there was a, a bill that did not pass because it never really went anywhere. That you said uh, a couple about of weeks that. ago about how many phone calls you got on oh that. Oh my! And yes. it's just, but the good news is it's it's dead. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that was when I talked about the people say, how in the heck do you you know did that specific bill get to the to the point that it did, and it was the mandatory immunization for, it was originally, anybody. anybody. Yeah. It started out as, when it was filed, it was, it was hospitals had to make available to hospital workers, you know, at the hospital's cost. And then it got amended to say, you know, nurses in direct contact patient with patients had to take them. And then when it went to the house, it said anybody who walks in the door that does any services to the hospital had to take them. And, and when it left committee in the house, that was the version it was in. And when it got to the floor, and, and I had more phone calls and emails on that issue than anything, anything we dealt with this year. The house on the floor decided, you know, we're going to assign this to a study committee because if, if this really needs to occur, let's talk about it. Well, the, the Senator Miller who filed the bill decided she didn't want to have a study committee. She said, I'm just going to let the whole issue die. So it's gone. It's gone. Okay. Well, we want to thank you for coming in every Friday and joining us. And, My and pleasure. We hope to see you more over the summer to kind of get us up to date on what, we can what is happening as we head into a new year. Our guest on all these Fridays for multiple Fridays has been State Senator Mark Mesmer, and we really do appreciate you coming in. Glad to be here. And we thank you for watching WJTS Inform. We're local people watching local people.